So I think we should get started. It's 2.30 p.m. Eastern. So whenever you let everybody in. Yes, everybody should be in. Um, I'll kick us off by um, saying good afternoon to everyone. Thank you so much for um, joining us this afternoon. Um, as Florence noted, it's 2.30. So we're going to start this month's COVID Information Commons Research Webinar. Um, so just, you know, welcome to this webinar. My name is Lauren Close. I'm the Operations and Communications Manager for the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub here at Columbia University. I'm also a lead member of the COVID Information Commons uh, project team. Um, the COVID Information Commons, or KIC, is a COVID-19 research collaboration platform brought to you by the Big Data Innovation Hubs and funded by the National Science Foundation's Convergence Accelerator. Every month, the KIC brings together scholars from across the country to share their research findings in the form of eight to 10 minute lightning talks. Each scholar will also engage the community directly, answering questions about their work during a Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Um, but before I introduce you to today's uh, fantastic group of researchers and speakers, I'd first like to hand the floor over to the Northeast Big Data Innovation Hub's Executive Director, Florence Hudson, who will say a few words um, about the kick. Thank you so much, Lauren. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for all of our presenters today. Thank you for all of our participants. Uh, you can share this video with other friends of yours. It's live on YouTube right now, and it'll also be on YouTube afterward, and feel free to uh, share it with others. So the COVID Information Commons started a little over a year ago. It was funded by an NSF Rapid Award from the Convergence Accelerator Program in the Office of the Director, and it serves as an open resource to explore NSF-funded research addressing the COVID COVID-19 pandemic. We originally created it to be an information commons. NSF said they wanted one place where anybody can find all the NSF awards related to COVID. And so we created it. And very interestingly, at our kickoff meeting in July of 2020, we had 178 people come and we expected like, you know, 50 maybe on a good day. And uh, we begged two PIs to do lightning talks and 40 more offered. So we decided this was really a community. Um, and so we wanted to listen to the community, said, congratulations, you're now a community since you want to you know, participate with each other more often. So we started that. Since then, we've had about a dozen, I think this may be our 13th um, webinar. We've had about 800 people participate in person, about 23, 2400. Look at the YouTube videos afterward. So what you'll find is that this will be on YouTube, the entire webinar. And then Lauren, God bless her, and the students on our team at Columbia will split it up into separate PI Lightning Talks so people could look directly at any of the PI lightning talks. We have really great news to share in that last week we were awarded a $2 million extension to the COVID Info Commons from NSF, which we're super excited about. That'll start October 1st. And what we're going to be doing is adding the NIH awards to the commons so that you can actually look at the abstracts and you can click through to the reporter tool to get more information about the awards. And we'll be adding all the new NSF awards related to COVID. So we'll have thousands of awards in the kick. Um, and we'll continue our student paper challenges, which we've done. Jane Pond actually is our first place student paper challenge from our inaugural kick student paper challenge. Um, the other two winners have already presented. And you can use this, it's open, you know, 24 by seven free to use the kick. You can look at um, the NSF COVID awards and PI database. Um, the PIs can provide information, links to collaboration opportunities, their research results websites, their ORCID IDs. And there's also a um, machine learning generated, uh, generated maps clustering tool to look at the awards by topic. So, and we encourage you to use this. It's your tax dollars at work. Um, and we really appreciate everybody joining us today. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, Florence. And um, I want to highlight today that in addition to uh, the two of us, we're joined on the back end by our fantastic um, volunteers and Columbia University students. We have today um, Benji Sango, who um, will be providing support to us through um, the live stream. And we also have one of our hub volunteers, Brian Buckley, who is a fantastic writer and will be constructing a summary of today's proceedings that will be posted on our website. So please take a, a look um, out for his, his great work. And um, now I'd like to just give you here this overview of today's speakers. Um, we'll be hearing from six fantastic scholars this afternoon who bring a diversity of perspectives and questions um, to the current pandemic research. 
Um, what I'd like to do is turn over the floor to our first speaker, and then when everybody has completed all of their presentations, we'll open it up to you, our audience, to um, ask questions for our speakers, and we'll bring a little bit more community into the conversation. Um, but first, let me turn it over to um, George of Loyola University of Chicago, who's going to um, give us his first presentation of the afternoon. Wonderful. Oh, stop, George, and I'll, I'll let you share your screen. Okay, thank you so much. And while he's bringing that up, we just like to encourage people, if you do have questions for the speakers, feel free to put them in the chat. They can answer them asynchronously, or we'll have an open Q&A session at the end. Go okay. ahead, George. Okay, and if I can just get confirmation that you're able to see my slides only. Looks great. All right, thank you so much. Um, first of all, when you get introduced as a fantastic speaker, it's kind of a tall order to live up to, but thank you for that very kind introduction to all of us, Lauren. And I'm gonna just dive right into this talk in the spirit of lightning talks. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna speak about observing human mobility during COVID-19. And our work is very much about being able to take advantage of what we call public cameras, public network cameras, and analyze this large, this vast amount of visual data captured from these cameras to look at how people are following social distancing during various stages of the lockdowns in various locations. We actually looked in this pilot study at just five countries and three states um, to analyze the effectiveness of these lockdown policies um, to see you know, if we could, if this can be a tool in the toolbox to you know, help reduce the spread of COVID-19. And the main challenge of the study is that we have millions of images. In fact, as, at, as of the, today, we have probably nearly 7 million images. Um, and then what we want to do is we want to be able to take those images and we want to be able to look at where these images are located and, and basically look at the policies that are in those locations and be able to see if there are any patterns uh, in, in the data. So this is very much a big data project. Um, and I want to say that I, I usually tell people, do not try this on your laptop at home. It will probably not work. And you may overheat your computer within a few minutes of the study. So um, without further ado, so basically, this slide here is showing just some samples of the kinds of images we have available. Uh, these are all again coming from you know public cameras that that are available for uh, you know they're on the net you know basically uh, typically like governments and individuals or other organizations like national parks have these cameras and they embed them on their web pages. They want to make them available to others. Um, not necessarily for research, but it's public. They're public cameras, so. Um, unlike the mass network of closed network cameras that exist in many municip municipalities, for example, these are uh, sources that can you know, legitimately be used for study without raising significant privacy and security concerns. Uh, so in our overarching research project, which is uh, the CAM squared project, which I had mentioned on the title slide, but didn't say too much about it in the interest of keeping on time, we actually have a process for discovering these cameras. We have uh, a, you know, papers on that topic. And the study we've done is basically where we capture data continuously from all of the cameras in our camera network. So we have about 36,000 cameras that we have um, discovered through this automatic process that we created. And what we collected data between April 2020 and March 2021. Like many people working on COVID, you know, we thought at first, maybe it's going to be a short you know, episode. And then we're like, well, this is seeming to go on. So maybe we should start some supercomputing jobs to just collect data from our entire camera network and just see what happens. Maybe we'll get around to analyzing it at some point. And that's what we did. Um, so this is using a large supercomputer at Argonne National Laboratory, um, where I have a visiting appointment. And we have access to some incredible resources there, but our storage network um, 
is capable of storing petabytes of data. It's just been upgraded to 200 petabytes. That's more than most people can even imagine what to do with. But um, we were able to you know, collect about 70 terabytes of data just for the cameras that we were looking at here. Okay, again, kind of difficult to put that on your laptop. Um, so the, then what we did is we basically had a job that ran every day, usually about five to six times a day. And then we take a snapshot of all these cameras simultaneously using a cluster computing job. It takes about 30 minutes to collect data simultaneously from all of these cameras, nearly simultaneously is a better way of putting it. Um, but that's a pretty extraordinary thing in its own right is just having demonstrated how we can collect so much visual data um, on supercomputers. Then what we did is we actually looked at the numbers of humans and vehicles over time we, because we wanted to look at human mobility more generally. So not just pedestrians, but also people getting into cars again, people not being in cars um, and other vehicles. And then we also looked at how this correlates with the Oxford Stringency Index, which is an index that measures what's going on with policy in various locales. Uh, our, the punchline of our study is that we think visual data, especially in future pandemics, will be a method that will be used uh, because it is already being shown to be effective for being able to understand the policies, which I'll show you in some charts toward the end. Okay, so th this is just a little bit about the workflow we use for this. I already mentioned the camera discovery process. And then what we did is we, applied a couple of filters just to make sure we're actually focusing on cameras that are actually going to really aid in the study, because there are many cameras that we have access to that are kind of uninteresting. Um, this is an example of an uninteresting camera. We had found one camera that actually is used to monitor like a, a, a road closure sign to make sure that the lights are still flashing. That's not going to tell us too much about human mobility. Uh, and then so we looked, we did some pre-processing just to find out which of these cameras are giving us uh, any kind of data relevant to mobility. So this could be, we see humans there, we see vehicles there, et cetera. Uh, and then after finding the cameras that actually meet these requirements, then we actually go through and do the analysis here. Um, Zoom is actually blocking my last part of the diagram, but I'm the key parts are, to first of all, find the relevant models. We have two different models that we're using. One of them is called Pedestron, which is a time-tested model for being able to look at uh, pedestrian-type traffic and other human traffic. You know, maybe not always a pedestrian walking like on a crosswalk. It's like in various settings. And then we have like YOLO V3, which is a general object detector. Um, we use that for, and we've trained that for actually being able to look at vehicles. And then, then there's some intelligence built into aggregating the data by location. Uh, we, we basically use a number of you know, geolocation type of services to be able to do that. And then that's how we were able to actually come up with these like analyses by either country or by state. Okay, of course the end result is we wanna make some pretty charts and I hope they're pretty enough for this presentation. We're still kind of finalizing that. Okay, anyway, so, the one thing we do is, you know, we have cameras in many locations. So in many cases, we're able to take the geo coordinates we have for these cameras, and then we're able to corroborate that with what Google Street View is telling us. And there is some human involvement in this process. So we had to actually, you know, for our representative cameras that we looked at, we did actually uh, you know, correlate them with Google Street, Street View. And as you can see here, like one of these cameras is showing, yeah, is showing ours, okay? And another is showing Google's, okay? And we see some of the same sign, you know, not the same words on the signs, but we definitely see the same placement of signs there. And we have pretty high confidence that that camera is where we think it is. The other thing that to, to do this kind of work requires that you, set up a validation data set that is going to be used to, to help us do a little bit better uh, analysis with both of those models I mentioned to you. So what we did is we actually took some of our 
you know, a subset of our images and just use them to uh, provide a little bit better labeling of, you know, this is a pedestrian, this is a car, and so on. And, and one of the challenges that we face in our data set is that because these are public cameras, they're like at all like random angles. They're like placed everywhere. <laughs> like they're, they, some of them are placed far away, some are close up. And so it, it actually requires that you look at different scenes and, and, and do some uh, you know, training there to make sure that what, when you actually look at any image in any of our data set, you have a higher chance of actually being able to classify accurately. Um, one thing I, I think, I don't know what happened here, I just sort of didn't mention one thing, but these, the, the, I, I mentioned the selected scenes, but I just didn't get a chance to mention them briefly that you can see here in the lower, the set of images, these are the ones where we're applying our object detectors to them. And we basically, these object detectors are typically going to give us, the, the green is the false, is, is, the, is the positives, and then we have blue, which is showing some that are false positives and red are the negatives. Yes, yeah, so you can see that like these object detectors do really well at classifying, this is just showing pedestrians here, but they do a really good job of identifying pedestrians, even like distant objects, you know, manage to be classified fairly accurately as pedestrians, okay, or people, all right. So anyway, um, so what, what are the key findings? This is what I want to spend a little bit of time talking about. Okay. I wanted to use some more minutes. I dropped something on the floor. <laughs> okay. Well, the key findings are that this does really well. So I wanted to show you a little bit about like how these, these charts are organized here. So basically we have an opening they, like this is when like there's an opening happening. This is when there's a lockdown. So I, the unfortunately there's some pixelation happening here in when I went from PDF to PNG. But this is an opening in France. So O of France, lockdown in France, and then another opening in France. And it's very it's very clear to see that in especially in places where there were consistent policies about opening and closing, we definitely see you know the uptick in activity that happens both vehicular and pedestrian traffic in the cameras that we have in those locations, okay? Really ticks up, of course, as bad news starts to tick, you know, come in, you know, we start seeing people even pulling back in advance of the lockdown that takes place, for example, in France, okay? Um, we all know the U.S. is kind of an interesting story, and one of the things that's Quite fascinating, and all of our, you know, with, especially our charts for places like Georgia, we can see that, like, because the stringency index is, you know, is pretty flat here, we can see that the patterns of, you know, corresponding to, okay, I'm sorry, I'm lost a little bit of my, yeah. So you can see that there's a lockdown and an opening in Georgia, and then that opening just sort of continues forever, and, and of course, the activity. You know, is actually we do see like especially like vehicular activity is continuing to increase as the probably as the economy is opening up, but you know we see it otherwise kind of an inconclusive story there. But definitely when it comes to uh, places with consistent policies, and of course Europe has actually been pretty good in this regard. Um, we see that the the patterns of openings, lockdowns, and if there's a, like a second opening that happened. Okay, we did not uh, have a, a reopening in time for Germany, you know, at the time of this study. Okay, we get all of this from the what's published about the, you know, the opening, the, the lockdowns especially. Um, but yeah, you can see that the, the, the European countries are all doing pretty well. We do see that Australia, you know, and then the U.S. states are a little bit less consistent. Hawaii, we actually are still trying to understand more about what's going on there. But one thing we know is that in Hawaii, there were a, a number of people traveling to Hawaii, and they were basically following different rules than most of the people who were actually living in Hawaii. Um, so, so, so they're like, you know, the, the pattern looks a lot like Georgia, but maybe actually a little bit better than Georgia in terms of what's actually going on. So the, the takeaway, though, is that, you know, at least when we do see, you know, consistent policy, 
um, we are able to see a pretty strong connection between, uh, you know, when, when analyzing the visual data of what's actually going on both with pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Um, certainly the hope is that in the future, uh, there will be a little more consistency, uh, you know, when it comes to, to COVID-19 policy. And, but this is one of the reasons why we undertook our study in the first place, is we did want to have a sense of, of how people are actually responding to whatever policies are present. Uh, and of course, I, I know I'm going to get one question about whether we've analyzed other states. Yes, we have. But we also wanted to make sure that we had enough data, especially visual data, uh, for the locations we were analyzing. Because some states, for example, in the US, we do not have as many cameras as others. So anyway, I just want to say a little bit about that. I, we have a very large research team. Uh, this is a team that comprises probably We've, we've had a variable size. We have about 15 undergraduates. We've had you know, three graduate students involved. And of course, we have four faculty involved. You know, myself and Yong Xiang Lu were the, you know, the faculty leads for this work. And um, we have David Shoham, who has also collaborated with us from the Department of Public Health. He was at Loyola and has moved to East Tennessee State University and Wei Jakara from Information Science. So it just wouldn't be possible to even do a study like this without these uh, highly talented students and, and, and uh, faculty. So I just wanna make sure I acknowledge them. Thank you, George. Thank you, that was um, really, really interesting. Thank you for sharing your research with us. And um, as Florence noted earlier, if our audience members have any questions about this or any future presentation, um, remember that we'll be hosting a group Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. So you can um, please submit any questions to our speakers in the chat or hang on to those for a larger discussion as a group. Um, but now I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Janet Owasa, who's coming to us from the University of Utah. Janet, um, take it away. Thank you so much. I will share my screen and hopefully you guys can all see that. Um, so yeah, my name is Janet Owasa. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Utah. You can see Utah's background behind me here. So my lab specializes in uh, visualization, in particular of, in animation of molecular processes. And I'm really happy to have this opportunity to talk to you about um, a visualization that's focused on the SARS-CoV-2 life cycle. So one of the major goals of this project is to create a detailed animation of the SARS-CoV-2 life cycle based on the latest findings from the scientific community. So this is an illustration of the viral life cycle that was made by a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, Anne Liu. Um, and it shows the basic process um, of the life cycle. Starting with the upper left, you can see viral entry, um, followed by translation of viral RNAs that are made into proteins. And then the formation of these interesting um, structures called double membrane vesicles in the middle. Um, and that's where the viral RNAs are copied. And then on the right, we see the formation of new viruses that are then released from the cell. So to talk a little bit about our process, um, to create these animations, we start by consulting with SARS-CoV-2 experts um, from around the world, and then we develop these visual storyboards that are really based on our conversations um, with these experts. So one thing that's really important to note is that there's still a lot that we don't yet understand about SARS-CoV-2, um, and that these animations are really based on the current hypotheses that were available at the time that we made these animations. So I'm just gonna go ahead and play the video but first I, I do want to say that you know what I'm showing today is actually a pretty truncated version of the full length animation and that we really encourage you to check out the full animation on the link shown below it's at animationlab.utah.edu slash COVA all right so I'm going to play this um, so the first part of the animation focuses on sort of the anatomy of the virus, especially on the spike protein, which is shown in teal, kind of wiggling around there on the surface. Inside of the virus, we have the RNA, the viral RNA that's wrapped around um, nucleocapsid protein that's shown in gray. The next part of the animation focuses on how the virus gets in. So we can see these proteins on the respiratory cell surface, which is shown at the bottom. Um, we have these purple proteins called ACE2 that are able to bind to the spike protein 
um, on the virus, which is shown here again in teal. So ACE2 binding is thought to kind of lock uh, the spike protein in a specific kind of shape um, that then enables it to, to get opened, um, to stay in this open position. Proteases called Tempris 2 then kind of cut away parts of the spike protein and they kind of fall away. And that allows the spike protein to undergo a series of conformational changes. So the first one, it kind of acts like a harpoon. It injects itself into the membrane of the cell and then it folds back Back on itself, which really allows um, the membrane of the virus to fuse with the membrane of the cell. At this point, uh, basically the nucleocapsid, the RNA genome is able to enter the cell. The next stage uh, shows early translation. So soon after nucleocapsid entry, ribosomes are recruited to the viral RNA and they start translating vi viral proteins. Uh, these proteins are called non-structural proteins or NSPs and they're initially translated as a long chain of proteins. Um, they generally, these, these proteins have a large range of, range of functions. So some of the NSP genes encode proteases that can cut the NSPs apart and that's necessary for their function. Um, others form a, a polymerase, which is shown in the next segment of the animation, and others have yet undiscovered functions. So some of these NSPs, um, especially kind of showing going to the next segment, um, are thought to mediate these kind of changes in the endoplasmic reticulum membrane that allows for the formation of the double membrane vesicles. Um, so you can see the double membrane vesicles forming here and encapsulating some of the viral RNA within them. And these DMVs are thought to be a really important way that the virus is able to evade the cell's innate immunity uh, mechanisms. So next up, we have a, a pretty short 2D animation that describes the way that SARS-CoV-2 makes subgenomic mRNAs that encode structural proteins, including uh, proteins like spike proteins, the things kind of you saw um, in the initial animation. So what happens within the DMVs? So within the DMVs, we have these replication transcription complex, which is a key complex that's responsible for producing viral RNAs. And they're made up of a, a number of different NSPs. So the replication transcription complex includes an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase and also a helicase um, that's uh, capable of unwinding double-stranded RNA. And this is really responsible for making mRNAs of the structural proteins that can go on to be made into proteins, um, and as well as uh, copies of the full-length genome that then get packaged into new viruses. So one thing to note is that we're still working on the final part of the life cycle that will show how basically viruses are being produced in the cells um, and then how they egress. So again, that was just a pretty, pretty truncated version of the full length animation and we really would love it if more people um, kind of checked out the full animation on this website. Um, the second part of this project focuses on creating annotation and commenting software, and this really enables us to describe the data that we use to create the animation, and it also allows the community to comment and to ask questions and critique the hypotheses that, are, that we depict in this, in this animation. So this is a snapshot of what that tool looks like. It's a web-based tool, totally free to use. You can check it out right now on the website. Um, so you can see the animation in the center there. You can play the animation, and on the left side, their, their annotations, so what, to, what kind of papers did we use, um, what structures did we use to create this animation, and on the right side are comments and questions from the community. So to show you what that looks like here, I'm playing the animation, I pause it, you can mouse over any of the structures you see in the animation to figure out what those proteins are, and then if you click on them, you can see the annotations that are associated with that structure on the left side. Um, and there's additional sort of visual data visualization tools below it. So we think as, as molecular animators, we think that this type of tool is really important, especially for projects like this, where there's a lot of current research happening. Um, and there's a lot of things that we think we understand well about how the virus works, but there are also a lot of things that are still quite uncertain. So we're hoping that the animation combined with the annotation and commenting tool will really allow the community to engage in fruitful discourse about you know, what happens during the SARS-CoV-2 life cycle, and to better understand whether we're coming to a consensus about how the virus works. Um, so again, we really would love to see more comments and questions from the community, um, and it will also be the basis on which we may make future revisions for the animation. 
And with that, um, that is the end of my presentation. I wanted to give thanks to my lab members, particularly to Anne Liu and Margot Riggi, who uh, helped me animate uh, the viral life cycle, and to our collaborators, Mariah Meyer and Jen Rogers, who are involved in creating the annotation software. So with that, I'll stop sharing. And I, yeah, I look forward to questions at the end. Thank you so much, Janet. That was fantastic. Um, we really appreciate you sharing your research with us. Um, I want to quickly turn this over to our next speaker today, um, Jane Pan. Um, Jane is actually one of three winners of our inaugural Kick Undergraduate Student Paper Challenge. She's a first place winner. Um, the challenge was held earlier this spring, and we welcome Jane. are very excited to share her research with the broader Kick community. So, Jane, um, take it away. Okay, let me share my screen real quick. Um, hopefully that's working. Is that working? Okay, great. Awesome. Okay, so I hope you've all been happy and great starts of fall. My name is Jane. I graduated from Columbia this past spring and I'm now at Princeton for graduate school. I'm very happy to present the work that I did during my senior year of undergrad with Professor Chen Hua Wen from Columbia University's Data Science Institute. Um, our project investigates contradiction detection of COVID-19 randomized control studies using mass language models such as BERT. So a little bit of context first. Um, contradictory results in clinical studies has been a long-standing problem for academics, researchers, and doctors alike, especially in a field with such a high volume publications. One study found that a third of original clinical studies are either challenged or unable to be replicated. And another found that a fourth of randomized controlled trials in particular are outright contradicted by later findings. And this was issue, this is an issue that became especially tangible during the outbreak of COVID-19. We've all heard about hydroxychloroquine, whose initial clinical studies were really optimistic, and later the findings were contradicted um, pretty decisively. And so analyzing and interpreting results from a large and continually changing body of work is a challenge that's really important during time-sensitive scenarios like the global pandemic. So um, to us, facilitating the process of identifying, contradicting, or agreeing studies would be really crucial for scientists who might want to, for instance, uh, conduct systematic reviews, identify what might cause differing results between two studies, evaluate the veracity of a research claim, and characterize the state of consensus or maturity on a particular research question. And so for our, our research project, the question that we asked ourselves was, how can we systematically extract evidence-based knowledge from raw text alone in order to quickly and automatically identify which studies agree and disagree? So we formulate this problem as a standard natural language inference or NLI task. And the claim or the aim is to classify a pair of sentences as contradicting, entailing or agreeing, and neutral, meaning that the sentence claims are unrelated or they neither entail nor contradict each other. So the language model objective here is um, more formally given a pair of sentences x1 and x2 with some mass classification token CLS and some parameter uh, matrix. We choose a label that maximizes the, the probability that the final state of CLS um, is, is that label for that specific x. And we choose mass language models here, specifically BERT, because these have historically had very strong performance with NLI tasks. Um, we use pre-existing pre-trained models as the base model for our projects. The goal is to use transfer learning by adapting these models to our specific NLI task. And we consider three base models. The first being the generic BERT model, which is pre-trained on books, corpus, and Wikipedia. And then two domain-specific models, BioBERT, which is pre-trained on PubMed abstracts and articles, and Clinical BERT, which is pre-trained on MIMIC3 clinical notes. So for us, the most crucial consideration was how fast the model would adapt to new research questions, because in practice, you'd want the model to find contradictions in new research, which it might not be pre-trained -pre on. So to that end, we knew we needed a data set with research areas and questions that had never been seen before by the base models. And so we made our own data set. We manually annotated a novel data set using LitCOVID, a publicly available database of COVID-19 PubMed articles. This is because COVID-19 is very recent and it wouldn't have been present in the data used to pre-train the base models. Um, and in line with other biomedical NLI corpora annotation methods, we identified 15 separate research questions and 103 studies that answered them. So we manually extract a sentence from each abstract that directly addresses the research question. And then two independent annotators manually label the pairs as contradiction, entailment, or neutral with respect to the research question. So uh, any labels that had disagreeing conclusions were, were tossed out. 
To build our model, we add uninitialized classification layers to the base models and fine tune. Um, we keep the base layer parameters frozen for now since we have a relatively small train set and we only fine tune the classification layers. Um, for our train set, we use a Mancon corpus, a publicly available manually annotated uh, medical inference NLI corpus, very similar to what we did, but more broad, uh, not just COVID-19. Um, and we also reserve a small portion, about 20% of the lit COVID data set for training. And we were really cautious about preventing contamination between test and train because the model has generalized to, generalized to questions that it hasn't seen before. So to that end, we removed any pairs that mixed test and train sentences. So what that means is that if a research question appeared in the train set, it will not appear in the test set and vice versa. We tokenize the sentence pairs and for each base models, we train two models, one that added that small portion of lit COVID data to its train and one that only used Mancon corpus. And we do this because we wanna see how much the model improves with just a very small portion of COVID-19 specific data added to it. Um, so here are the results for our classification metrics. Um, of all the models, BioBERT and Clinical BERT with L with lit COVID data performs the best, which makes sense because the base models are trained on a similar domain to lit COVID. And unsurprisingly, if you add lit COVID training data, it performs better than, than a model that doesn't. But I'd like to like note the improvement, like the very drastic improvement with a very small proportion of COVID training data. So the F scores are improving by a large degree. Almost all of them are like near doubling with the exception of the precision column, which is pretty strong across all the models. Um, here we show the recall on a class by class basis, and we see some pretty interesting patterns here. So far in a way, contradiction is a class that performs the best, even with models that did not have any lit COVID data uh, training data added to it. And we hypothesize that this may be because negating terms like no or not are universal across topics and domains. So maybe the a model can identify negations pretty quickly. Um, we saw that lit COVID training data primarily improves the neutral predictions. You can see it's like doubling the number of correct neutral predictions, which is most likely because it now that it has lit COVID training data, it knows which COVID words don't necessarily um, like suggest contradiction or entailment. Um, and entitlement is relatively weak overall, except for BioBERT with lit COVID. And we think that this might be because BioBERT's pre-training corpora actually came from PubMed, so it may have learned features that helped it better identify textual affirmation or negation in a biomedical domain. So in summary, we have strong evidence to show that BERT models are a valid approach for contradiction detection in the biomedical domain. We have three pre-trained models which need only a small amount of training data for drastically improved performance. Um, and just some error analysis very briefly, um, some common patterns we found were, as we saw earlier, struggling with identifying neutral terms. And then we saw some confusion with uh, like abbreviations or medical terminology. So for instance, HCQ and hydroxychloroquine, the model doesn't immediately know that they're the same thing, so it'll say it's neutral or unrelated, um, and so on and so forth. So for the future, uh, some of the interesting questions that we think could be answered are like, how can we automatically select the best sentence without needing to manually extract this? And there are already some text summarization tools for clinical studies already in um, like openly available, such as Trial Streamer or the Wang Labs Pico Parser. Um, so I'd be interested in seeing how they could integrate this with the contradiction detection tool. And also, we're curious to know if we can improve the model's performance by um, you know, supplying a user provided list of acronyms or synonyms for that domain uh, that the model is likely to come across. Um, that's all I have for today. Um, I'd like to conclude by thanking Professor Wang and Dr. Hao Liu for their mentorship and help throughout my research. And also a big thank you to Stan and Marguerite for their kind assistance with the project. Uh, thank you for your time and I hope you all have a great week. Thank you so much, Jane. That was really fantastic. Um, we're blown away by how, um, you know, professional and just together your research is as a student. Um, we're so glad that we could feature your work here as one of our paper challenge winners. I'm honored. Thank you so much. Um, next, I'd actually like to introduce if he's um, still, I think he's still here with us as a participant today, um, Professor Samson Daran, who's with us from Columbia University. Um, Sam, would you like to uh, go ahead and, and give your presentation. Maybe not. Okay. You know what? Um, that's all right. Why don't we switch over to um, the next speaker in our uh, in our queue for today? Um, I think that's Kristen. Yes, Kristen Miller, who's coming to us um, to do a little bit of um, you, you speaking about CD. Video, I think. Oh, Sam. Uh, okay. Hang on one second. Let me find you.
and you didn't want to see me. Sure, here, let me um, help you with, I think, your video. There you are. Okay, okay. okay great. Um, if you'd like to um, try sharing your screen, we'll see if we can get that started too. So it's for me now? Yes. Okay, share the screen. Okay, that is that's better, much better than my original schedule, which was eight, okay. eight speaker. I felt like the the eighth wife of uh, King Henry who got who got killed. <laughs> so this is much well, better. With the thing. Anyway, it never lasts. There you go. <laughs> so is can you see my screen? I can. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. You can put it in presentation mode. Hit the present button on the top. Okay next to the share button. You see where it says present all the way at the yeah. top. Next to the share button. Oh, oops. Uh, it's OK. You can just proceed. Yeah, usually there is a, a video. It's all the way at the top. You see where the share button is, oh, the uh, orange button? You see next to on the right. All the way on the right. Go to the right, go to the right, go to the right. Keep going, keep going, go down. <laughs> Present, go down, go down, go down, please, go down. Now go to the left. See, it says present. Oh, there you go. That's better. Perfect. Here we go. All set. Thank you. So, the idea of these projects is to have methods by which, to which, by which you can mitigate the spreading of this virus or the future one. And one of the problems in, the, in using the current method, if you use bleach, solu bleach solution and you spread it with the hazmat, it just drips. It doesn't stay there long enough. So we are looking at ways to generate, you know, I like beer and a lot of people like beer, I'm sure. So we thought, you know, how about if we use foam which should stick to almost any surface, depending upon the structure of the foam. So our idea is to generate nanostructured foams so that it will, it will stick to the surface for whatever time you want. In the case of Ebola, it was, this project started at the time of Ebola half, for half an hour. So depending upon that, you can, depending upon the time you want, you can control the formulation. And we tested this foam structure uh, on, a, on, a, on a screen, that you can see that in front of the Columbia garage at 7 a.m. by graduate student. I'm not a morning person, I wasn't there, but that, that's where it was tested. Okay, so the main idea is to then, to eliminate the use of bleach, which has other problems that are shown here. They irritate the skin, the bleach fumes cause lungs to burn when inhaled too much. And if you use vinegar uh, for various purposes, it creates deadly gas. Try to move this, uh, okay. Also, exposure to quartz harms spring quality. I don't have to worry about that this age, but a lot of people should worry about it, spam quality. And the widespread use also produce superbugs. That I do have to worry about because it avoids, it, it makes it difficult to use antibiotics, as you know. And the potent chemicals can contaminate the surfaces that come in contact with. And more serious problem is that the toxic effluent is a major problem. So the idea is how to avoid the use of um, uh, the bleach foam. So this is the foam, this is the wet foam, which still has a lot of liquid. We want to also avoid the toxic effluent, such as that is generated during washing of any kind of uh, surfaces, lot of, uh, so that we want to avoid. So if you have, if you have the wet foam drain, this is the um, photo generated by my mentor, previous Dr. Meisels. All his, uh, most of his men, protesters went to Nobel Prize. Get, uh, get, get. Anyway, he's in the heavens now. Um, and then you get the dry foam. Dry foam has very, very little liquid, 
between the lamellae, between the bubbles, and so not much is generated. That's one of the main advantages. And you can have the formulation in such a way that it will kill the virus. Another advantage is that we could incorporate penetrate, super, super spreaders like the silicone shown here. My first graduate student uh, makes the, some of these modified silicones. He is a genius. He also made, by the way, the first, the first flat plate uh, display system we are looking at. And they can penetrate because they can penetrate into cracks and they can also penetrate in under, the, under the rug, which is it's where usually virus can hide. And this is very, very important. So, so that is what, and another purpose was some of the surfactant soaps that you use are toxic, like sodium dioxide sulfate. If you wash your hands very often, then you will see, if you look at your hands, the hands become dry. Our idea was to use benign microbial biosurfactants, which are some of them are shown here. But more important one was the surfactant that is generated actually by the microbe. Surfactant is very effective. It also has uh, uh, other effects such as to stop the cancer and things like that. So this was another another project. So with that, with all that, we we uh, generated this formulation. The idea by which the foam life is controlled is shown here. This is a lamellae between two bubbles, and these two surfaces come towards each other. All the water will go and the bubble will escape. But if you, if you have the right kind of surfactant layers which repel each other, then some of the water will be retained. And that is how you control the structure, by controlling this surfactant layer, you can control the amount of water that is drained. That is how you can control it, the formulation. And so what are the advantages? First of all, you can, you can use minimum bleach, just that, just that is necessary, or new, no bleach at all in some cases. The other advantage is you can get nanostructured foam which will stick to surfaces. Then sufficient deposition and uniform coverage, which you can test very, very switch. You can get uniform coverage so that is no, there are no spot left. And also, as I said, you can reach uh, uh, not only roofs, uh, which has, if, you, if I have a roof like the one I have here, to absorb sound, there will be also a virus that will absorb here. And you can see ordinary, ordinary sprayers and no splashback. Splashback is always a problem when you're in a hurry. Uh, and you can use some of these sprayers or, or bigger ones if you want to use rooftop or even top of air, airplanes. You can use such things. So there are various ways to use, use it. Uh, so this is the last slide, I think. So results, we have developed optimum robust formulations. And the formability it was studied, which I didn't cover at all using infrared technique and other techniques. I didn't cover that here. Uh, and degree of foam deposition on different target surfaces was looked at. Foam delivery options also was looked at using various, uh, very, very simple, like the one that you use for car wash. And finally, our product uh, with, that is licensed to uh, a, a company called Universal Formulations is, is on the market. This is, that is there, but we don't, they don't have any funding. We don't have any funding to market it, to have a TV, advertisement and every, everything on, everything. So it, this trademark pending. So we need funding to for, for, for marketing or some kind of venture capitalist. So we are hopeful this is, and you know, unfortunately, as you know, this virus is not going to go away for a long time or there will be other viruses. And this kind of strategy is very, very important for future pandemics also. So this was supported by one of the NSF rapids and we're very, very great, great, grateful for that. Without that, we couldn't have done it. So thank you. And I hope uh, I used just my time, sufficient time. Yes, last thank time, you very much. That was perfect. Last time Lawrence said that I finished too soon. I, that's <laughs> surprising. Usually, you know, I speak fast and there's a reason for it. My 
passport. My professor complained when I came here. He's 93, still going strong. That Indians speak very fast. And I said, there's a reason for it. Our life expectancy is short. We can't fool around like you people. We have to be more productive and speak fast. <laughs> so, <laughs> No, you were perfect. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us, Sam. We really appreciate it. Um, and then I want to take this moment to hand uh, over the presentation to, I think, Kristen Miller, who's going to take us um, in a different direction on COVID research next. Um, Kristen, let's see. I think, Sam, you may have to stop sharing your screen so Kristen can take over. There we go. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for having me. I'm really enjoying the multidisciplinary um, nature of um, the session today. And as Lauren mentioned, I am going to be presenting on more healthcare delivery research um, and specifically more participatory research. Are you able to see my screen? It looks a little bit strange for me. Yeah, it's slightly up oh, there. That's a lot better. Okay. I don't know what you did, but it worked. <laughs> Great, thank you. I'm Krista Miller. I'm the scientific director of the MedStar Health National Center for Human Factors and Healthcare, but I am representing a much larger project today that includes uh, multiple healthcare systems. So this is a project actually funded by the CDC, um, a two-year award, um, again, includes lots of different healthcare systems, but I think really the the beauty of this project is a number of different features where we are engaging with the community, but to look at the spread of COVID-19 in a number of different ways. So we have participants that uh, are participating in daily syndromic surveillance. So you can imagine folks that maybe are experiencing some symptoms, but don't rise to the level of requiring clinical care. We have participants um, that conduct monthly serology tests. Um, and so in that way, we're capturing participants that perhaps are asymptomatic, we have symptom and serology triggered virology data, and then we have linked electronic health record data. So in that third component, the EHR data, we're actually capturing patients that are hospitalized. So we're able to get asymptomatic all the way up to um, hospitalizations. There are a number of different sites. Um, I represent MedStar Health in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, but six sites that were funded by the CDC, MedStar Health and University of Maryland representing that Mid-Atlantic area, Wake Forest, who's leading this project, and Atrium Health, representing North Carolina, and then in the Deep South, University of Mississippi and Tulane. Uh, there was, um, at the same time, a project funded through the CARES Act for the state of North Carolina, so that includes Atrium Health and Wake Forest in both cohorts, and then other healthcare systems in the North Carolina area. Um, so again, really two key components here. The first is daily syndromic surveillance, and you can see some screenshots at the top. Every day, um, folks get a, um, a request to complete this daily status through their email or through a push notification on their smartphone. It asks questions like, do you consider yourself healthy? Are you experiencing any symptoms? Um, are you wearing a mask? Have you had any exposures? And then collecting information about test results for COVID. Um, we've also added information, of course, about vaccines and now specifically um, the flu vaccine as well. And then there's the monthly serology tests. So these are at-home kits, uh, which we thought was pretty important during the pandemic to make sure that this could all be, you know, from the safety and comfort of one's home. Um, and those are blood spot uh, kits that you, you know, conduct in your home and then, and then mail back. So collectively here, we're able to capture symptoms. We can look at social distancing and personal protective equipment, like masks, access to healthcare, and then more objective measures like prevalence of antibodies and also vaccine-related outcomes. We have more than 60,000 uh, people that are participating in this study. Obviously, around the healthcare systems that I mentioned, but we have at least one participant in every one um, of the states. Um, and we even have some international participants as well, which is quite exciting. Just as a summary of how much information we've been able to gather over the last um, year or so, we have more than four and a half million daily symptom updates. We have more than 150,000 serology results. And that's most of what I'll focus on sort of the preliminary findings that we have right now. And then across all of the different sites, we have more than 17 million electronic health record data elements. And this includes a number of things. So demographic information, behavioral information like smoking and alcohol use, vaccine related information, um, and then general information about a primary care visit, an urgent care visit, um, a hospitalization. We capture medications, vitals and lab results, active problems and diagnoses, 
anything else that happens in the encounter or in an outpatient procedure. This is the distribution. So um, the gender distribution, you see all the way on the left, these are the uh, males and females participating in the study at large. So meaning the daily syndromic surveillance. But then we took a subset of those participants and asked them to participate in serology. And so you see there's a sampling strategy here. Um, you see the gender on the left and then age on the right. So we've oversampled different populations uh, to try to get some more information. And you see that most relevant here when we look at race and ethnicity. So the total bar is everyone that's in the study. The darker green shows uh, the sampling so for serology. So you'll see that we've oversampled for uh, minority populations on the left. Of all the things that I'm sharing today, I think this is the piece that um, I'm most excited about and, and perhaps most proud of is the results of the serology testing in terms of participation. So this is MedStar data specific. Um, we have over 8,500 participants. And again, this is a monthly um, blood spot test and we have almost 45,000 kits that have gone out. There's about a thousand people who received a kit. They said they wanted to participate, but never returned that first kit. Um, but outside of that, that means there's 7,500 people that have been doing this. Um, and more than 50% of those people are in at least their sixth kit or their seventh kit. Um, and that's pretty incredible community participation. So 78% of all the kits, more than 34,000 um, are representing people who have returned at least five kits. So you can imagine we're looking at antibodies over time, that continued participation is quite important. So I'll share with you some of the antibody results. What we did is conduct two different antibody tests in our study. We're trying to figure out if people are developing antibodies from natural infection um, or natural transmission or from vaccination. So um, essentially, you develop antibodies uh, about one to four weeks after infection or vaccination. And the spike protein antibody starts to rise if you've been infected with the virus. The nucleocapsid antibody will also rise, uh, but people who, and people who have been vaccinated, um, they won't have that nucleocapsid antibody. And we can see how long it takes for them to develop and how long it takes for them to decay. So based on these different tests, we're able to see how many people had a COVID vaccine, how long antibodies lasted after vaccination, whether someone who's been vaccinated can get infected. And we're looking at those breakthrough cases uh, with and without symptoms. How many people have been vaccinated um, get infected? How many people, um, how long antibodies last after detection and whether people with antibodies after infection can get affected, infected again for a second time. So this first results is focused on antibody development. How long does it take for antibodies to develop? The test on the left is the Euroimmune. This is a research grade test. So it's much more sensitive. It's much, much more specific. Um, and you can see consistent with what guidance we're getting from the CDC, about two weeks after vaccination, you start to see those antibodies rise. This is looking at different age groups. And so it's taking longer for an older population generally to develop those antibodies. The test I'm showing you on the right is the Inavita lateral flow assay, and this is more commercial grade. So you might be wondering for a CDC funded research study, why are we using a test that's less, less sensitive and less specific? I think we really want to think more pragmatically about this. Um, if folks in the community are using this community level for these commercial level um, tests, are they getting the right results and how might that be impacting their behavior or the policy? So in this less sensitive test, we're seeing a similar trend. It's taking longer for older people to develop antibodies, uh, but we still see them around that two week period, um, but we're not detecting as many, again, because it's not as good of a quality of a test. Then we can look at zero prevalence. So zero conversion means you didn't have antibodies and then you do. On the left, we're looking at the national cohort. So the sites funded by the CDC. We didn't start doing this as early as we would have liked. So you would have expected to have seen more natural infection, but uh, that's just because we didn't have as many of those tests going out. But it is interesting to see when the vaccine was available, just how many people were vaccinated and you see just a tremendous uptake in antibody development. Another interesting piece here, looking just specifically at the North Carolina cohort, is the difference between non-healthcare workers and healthcare workers. So um, we see different levels um, here of that zero conversion. So pre-vaccine, lots of natural infection, um, and then 
healthcare workers, we see a spike um, because they were one of the first in line to get the vaccine. So we saw more antibodies develop. Um, one of the things I think um, top of mind and, and in the media right now is antibody decay. And so we're looking at that as well. How long can we detect antibodies after infection? These graphs are showing not vaccine induced antibodies, but natural transmission. And so you're seeing on the left, this decay in antibodies. Um, and so for folks that had that natural transmission, we're seeing the antibodies um, start to go away after two or three months. Um, one other interesting finding, which is this graph on the right, is that the folks who had um, posse or asymptomatic COVID, they didn't have as many symptoms, they weren't as sick. Those antibodies go away a whole lot faster than someone who had a higher severity case of COVID. So I wanna make sure I'm not contributing to misinformation here. These are quantitative, these are not quantitative tests. We're either detecting antibodies or we're not. Um, we're not calculating how many antibodies we're able to see, but it is interesting the body um, is just pretty amazing in terms of how it responds. So you might not have detectable levels of antibodies, uh, but because of your um, B cells and T cells, they might immediately engage and react when they meet the virus. Um, you might also have detectable antibodies um, and still have those breakthrough cases. So this is in no way you know, a perfect test to say whether or not you would get infected. We're also looking at symptoms, which has been really interesting. So 35% of folks that zero converted, they didn't have antibodies and then they did either from natural infection or from vaccine reported symptoms in that month prior to the test, the, the blood test that they had returned. Um, and so a lot of those um, symptomatic cases and then you're seeing about 65% um, were asymptomatic or didn't report anything in their daily um, symptom reporting. We can also look at different clusters of symptoms. So you see on the right, Folks that are presenting with congestion and loss of taste and smell or a headache, um, those are associated with having um, a positive antibody test. Um, and then you see things, combinations like diarrhea, shortness of breath, nausea, that those are less frequently associated um, with having developed antibodies. And the thicker the line, the stronger the association. Um, and so this has been interesting for us to look to see what are the symptoms that you would expect to see for a COVID case. Um, and then lastly, we're looking at um, symptoms reported amongst folks that had zero converted in the long term. And so again, really important right now to think about long COVID and the type of symptoms that folks are reporting. For here, you see a really significant amount of time. Time zero is when we have that zero conversion. So for the week before that, there are some symptoms, um, heavier symptoms in the first couple weeks um, of infection. And then we see some of them continuing 30, 40 um, weeks after having that infection. Then these, this is natural infection, not just um, not the vaccine related. We're also able to deploy some supplemental surveys. So in that daily symptom reporting, we're able to sneak in a few of these other surveys to get more information from folks that are participating. So some interesting findings here, we released a survey around Thanksgiving and then another um, around the winter holidays. We had more than 20,000 respondents um, and not surprisingly, folks were gathering with people outside of their household, some for Thanksgiving, even more around the holidays. Only 30 to 40% of those folks wore masks and less than one fifth of them were tested prior to gathering. You can see those um, you know, public health type behaviors in the top right. And then lastly, we looked at vaccine attitudes. Um, of course, we're interested in things like vaccine hesitancy. In one recently published report, this includes just um, folks from North Carolina cohort, more than 20,000. Um, and we did see hesitancy, vaccine hesitancy, noted in specific subgroups, specifically African-Americans, um, folks living in more suburban area, women and folks with prior infection. So again, thinking about um, some of the misinformation about protected immunity and that having infection protects you for a long amount of time, which we've demonstrated it does it. And the main concern being about safety and a lack of testing in the vaccine. We did follow those people over time. And so by May, we had seen most of them had been vaccinated, including more than 50% who initially expressed resistance. So ongoing and future activity, um, focused right now on breakthrough infections, of course, and variants of concern. So following Delta, um, and looking at some of that virology to see how that spread um, across the country, especially trying to inform the need for boosters. So we'll continue these serology tests and be able to see some of that antibody decay. 
We're also looking at the EHR data. So like many other folks really interested in the long-term sequelae, the total burden of the pandemic on the healthcare system. Um, and then right now really focused on immunocompromised um, patients, what their experience has been, are they developing antibodies and are they um, experiencing any vaccine hesitancy? So um, thank you. This is you know, an army of people behind this work um, and it's really led by the community and their participation. So thank you for your time and happy to answer questions once all the speakers are done. Thank you so much, Kristen. We really appreciate your taking the time to present with us. Um, I want to hand it over to our last, but certainly not least, um, of our speakers today, Francesca Saylor. Francesca, it's all yours. Thank you very much. So I'm the president and CEO of Through Four Technologies. Um, we were awarded last year an NSF grant, a phase one SBIR grant to investigate the antiviral activity of novel nitrogen doped carbon supported catalyst against COVID-19 surrogates. Just to summarize my, my talk briefly, I'm going to go over current air filtration solutions, the capture technology that they use, through pores technology and the actual efficacy studies that we did against viruses and bacteria. So just to review of uh, particles of different sizes, uh, modern day air filters, HVAC filters are designed to capture mostly larger particles. Um, they specifically focus around this uh, dust particle size, uh, 2.5 micron and above is our uh, particles that they're very good at catching. Um, unfortunately, the coronavirus and other viruses are within the more difficult to capture size range, which ranges from approximately one micron to about 0.3 microns. So prior to COVID, um, most air filters that were used in, let's say, office buildings, small businesses, uh, places like that, you would generally use a MERV 6 to a 10 graded air filter. And most of the air was recirculated and it, it only, uh, the system only diluted the air about 20%. Um, since uh, the pandemic has started, now ASHRAE is recommending these MERV-13 rated air filters that will capture a little bit more of those uh, particles in that size range and uh, also 100% outside air. Of course, this is not good for your um, HVAC system. It does provide more, it just does cause more um, stress on the system. It uses more energy. Um, and then you also have the HEPA filters, which are not designed for you know, for use in everyday systems. Um, the HEPA technology, however, it's, it's very unique. It's completely different. You don't really get uh, passed through the air filter itself. You have the airflow that passes over the plates. So when you have particles in that uh, one micron to 0.3 micron size range, they don't actually move in a linear fashion like uh, other other size particles, both larger and smaller. They in fact move uh, randomly using uh, Brownian motion. So designing a HEPA filter where you have air move over these pleats allows for that Brownian motion to occur and you get more capture. Um, this does make the air filter itself more efficient. However, it's, it's pretty thick. And um, so if if anybody in here has a HEPA filter, the, you know, a HEPA system themselves uh, within, generally they're within smaller uh, uh, room units, you'll notice that they're pretty loud. Um, it takes a lot of force to pass air uh, over all of those plates. And again, they're not recommended for use in a regular uh, HVAC, HVAC system. So what Throughpour does is um, we make porous carbon. We make uniquely porous carbon. It's approximately 90% porous. So if you were to um, zoom in on the carbon itself, you'll notice that it has this tortuous porous structure. And in fact, these ligaments are also porous. 
So what we've been able to do is we, this is purely synthetic carbon. So we are able to, um, to control the purity, but also we can add dopants and, and things like that to really control what kind of catalytic reactions occur. So prior to COVID, we were, we've mainly been uh, enabling new reactions. We have uh, worked with the US Army Corps of Engineers to develop a munitions waste degradation catalyst. We've worked uh, with various other companies to um, increase, uh, to, to make a heterogeneous um, solid, or uh, sorry, fixed bed uh, coupling reactions, scale those up. And we've also commercialized um, plastic waste upcycling reactions. And what's unique to our material is that the more material uh, you have that flows through the catalyst, you get more products. So we have higher yields. We're able to really get very few side reactions. We can really focus in on exactly the reaction that you want to occur. So when uh, COVID began to uh, start happening, we, we started um, thinking about our product and um, with my training as a chemist, the first thing I thought of was, is there some sort of oxidative reaction that we could in fact and enable to, um, you know, destroy these viruses, among other things, at room temperature. So we we received the the NSF grant to further investigate this. So our um, our first our first and uh, quite successful um, catalyst that we tried was a zinc oxide catalyst, and it's very benign. It's found, found in uh, infant diaper cream as well as sunscreen. And it works by various different mechanisms. So it, it does uh, release reactive oxygen species as well as uh, zinc ions and um, would actually in a, or, uh, degrade the bacteria or an enveloped virus by directly contacting the membrane. So we started using, for testing, we looked at the um, EPA approved COVID viral surrogates. So specifically bacteriophage MS2. Um, the EPA has a viral hierarchy where it, it uh, looks at things that are more difficult to destroy versus things that are easier to destroy from an oxidative type of perspective. And MS2 is considered to be a small non-enveloped virus, so they consider it uh, more difficult to destroy than SARS-CoV-2. So with our testing, we used uh, a nebulizer to nebulize these uh, viral particles to kind of simu simulate a cough type of uh, situation. And we used an EPA adapted method uh, 1602 to detect these, um, these viruses in a water sample after they were to pass through the filter themselves. Then that water sample was diluted tenfold um, seven times to produce serially diluted samples. And that allowed us to actually count and um, determine the exact amount of virus that was present both before the filter was treated and then after, um, after a solution were to pass through or vapor. And then um, you would, we would count flax, which would indicate um, specifically we had a culture of E. coli and we would count viral plaque. So anything that was considered active and um, any viruses that were active and present, they would kill the E. coli and produce a hole in a viral plate. So the data is actually, um, this is the, the data that we in fact submitted to the EPA. Um, and as you can see, we have uh, four and five nine uh, efficacy. So that is greater than 99.99 .99 percent reduction of viral plaques. We also seen, see the same efficacy in another 
uh, bacteriophage that is approximately 0.3 microns, which is called a uh, T4 bacteriophage. Here's a picture of the plaques that I was discussing. So as you can see, an untreated filter, you have a lot of these viruses that in fact do get through. Whereas with ours, a treated filter, um, you see very few viruses survive and get through to kill that E. coli off. We also look at E. coli and um, found that we in fact stopped 100% of these uh, bacterial cultures, which at that point, um, we weren't quite sure. We wanted to make sure that we were killing bacteria and not just capturing bacteria. So we started looking into um, doing timed kill studies where we added the catalyst directly to a culture. And here is some data from that study. And as you can see, after about 10 minutes, we get a decent, we get about 70% reduction in the, uh, the amount of bacteria that is bi uh, viable. But after two hours, we get 0% of bacteria that is uh, viable. So we were able, um, we've done further studies and we've actually been able to specifically find the exact milligrams of active ingredient, which is the zinc oxide per colony forming unit. So we um, further went on to test this uh, with Staphylococcus aureus um, and also Klebsiella pneumoniae. So this is something that the EPA, EPA uh, these are considered hospital, hospital acquired infections. So they are very interested in these and want, they wanted us to specifically make sure that our catalyst would kill these as well. And they do, and it does, sorry. So with that, I'd like to conclude and um, just go ahead and announce that our final product developed does in fact kill greater than 99.99% of aerosolized viruses and bacteria. And I'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for funding the initial work. And then we've also had follow on funding through Newcastle County, uh, Delaware, as well as the state of Delaware. Uh, to further scale up this product and get it out there. So we are in fact selling um, air filters directly uh, coated with our product called, uh, we call it Dr. Filter. So um, <laughs> you can see our website, drfilter.com. And um, we are looking currently for a, an air filtration partner so that we can really get more of this product out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Francesca. Um, it's really interesting to see the overlaps between everyone's presentations and yet, you know, everyone's taking it different directions. So I know it's going to be an active uh, Q&A session. Um, so I want to end today's um, first portion of the webinar by thanking all of the researchers who shared their work with us today. Um, everyone's providing unique insights on COVID-19 and we appreciate your contributions. Um, for the audience, let me just say that each of our speakers' presentations will be made available on our website, covidinfocommons.net, and also on our YouTube channel later this week. Um, and before I hand this over to Florence for the q and A, I I want to briefly uh, share with this group information about our next COVID Info Commons webinar, which will be in um, late October. Um, these are the four speakers we have lined up for you um, on that date, Tuesday the 26th. So we hope that you'll join us then. You can see the registration information here. So please, uh, please plan to join us at that time. Um, and I also want to share with the group um, some information on how you can continue to remain engaged with the COVID Info Commons. Um, obviously, we have a website, but you can also subscribe to our newsletter or any of our social media channels. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, concerns about our events, you can always email us at info at covidinfocommons.net. I'll be dropping all of these links directly into the chat so you can peruse those at your leisure while we get the Q&A started. Um, so I, we want to open it now up to Q&A from our audience, and I'm going to kick it over to Florence to start that conversation.
Great. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you, everyone, for presenting. I always learn so much in these. Um, and Kristen, as you said, the multidisciplinary nature kind of takes you out of, you know, the little holes that we're all in and helps us think of others, which is really great. So I actually um, have a, a question I'd like to ask. I, I think all of the questions in the chat um, were answered already. But um, are there any questions from um, all the other participants that either the PIs who presented can present, you know, ask questions of each other or any of the other participants that would like to ask a question? Okay, so one of the things we're thinking about, you know, one of, uh, I've done some work with NSF before on transition to practice of research. I led some, um, some work with that at the NSF Cybersecurity Center of Excellence. And then when I was at internet too on, getting research out into the world. And a couple of things that were presented today, Soam's work, um, Frances's work, and, you know, Janet, even if you think of the, you know, the animation that you have, they're kind of out there. So one of the things that I've been thinking about, and I'd like some input from you all to see if you'd be interested, we would get into this in the fall after we get a, a, a COVID Info Commons program manager in place based on the new award, the extension we just got. But what we're thinking about is having like a transition to practice piece of the website that we could highlight, you know, what you have. And like, as an example, Francesca, you're saying that you're looking for an air filtration partner. And you could say that it's like a, a collaboration opportunity, but it's a collaboration opportunity to transition to practice and actually get you know, the research used in a practical way out there. So I was wondering what um, you all feel about that. Any of the, either the PIs who presented or the other participants, if you think that would be an interesting thing to have in the COVID information commons, any thoughts on that? I think that that's a great idea. I would, I would really appreciate that. That's always been my biggest um, issue is getting the message out there. It's not really, you know, to me, the technology is kind of easy, you know, <laughs> the hard part is the commercialization piece and yeah, any, any place where connections can be made and partnerships can be created would really help. That's really cool. You know, maybe even we can think of a kick webinar where we talk about that, like have a transition to practice kick webinar, you know, where people come and we can even invite you know, I don't know, VCs or something. It depends on what, you know, what's doing is some of us, I know I'm involved in some um, angels, you know, angel teams and stuff like that. So that could be rather interesting actually. So um, that, thank you for your input, Francesca. So we'll definitely get back in touch like in a month or two after we, uh, we get a new kick program manager. So they have, can help us get all this done. Lauren and I get to do everything that the hub does <laughs> with our students, which we're grateful for and our volunteers, thank God. Okay, any other comments on that on like a transition to practice element, yeah. George? I see your head nodding. Yeah, yeah. In fact, our, our group has a huge amount of interest in, uh, in, in business and, and you know, technology transfer and commercialization. And I suspect mm -hmm. this is true of many um, NSF and even NIH funded researchers because there's this, as computer scientists and engineers, we live in very much a world where like, you know, there's like the innovation is pretty much what defines what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, you know, I've been kind of in an unrelated context looking at, there's, a, there's this growing need. And, and in fact, there's a space for called matchmaking CRM. And mm -hmm. um, because I'm actually involved in some effort to improve faculty mentoring. And, but what I'm noticing is there are many situations like this that seem to keep coming up over and over again where there's really a need for proper matchmaking of mm -hmm. people who are doing research with other kinds, you know, other communities. Um, this yes. can even be like, you know, commercial and even non-commercial, like, you know, social good opportunities and that. Right. Sort of thing. And so as I was listening to Francesca's talk, I'm like, wow, you know, this is the kind of stuff. We, we have actually started some SBIRs in, in our own research group and, um, it's just amazing to see like, like, like how the, you know, going to the next level is really the biggest challenge. You know, you develop this incredible technology and then you realize to get it out there at scale Hard. is a real yeah. challenge. It really is. I know. Yeah. Okay. Well, I well, think it'd be really... a really great thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, as I say, with two points, you can make a line and then push everything else. Yeah. So you both said it was a good idea. Um, and so then we'll be back in touch with you all in a couple of months when we're ready to start thinking about how we might add that to the KIC website. Um, okay, very cool. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, any other comments or questions that anybody has for the speakers or for each other? Okay. 
I have a question, Janet. I don't know if you're still here. I know you had some things going on. Yeah, I'm here. Like, okay, great. So on the animation that you have, are you looking to get like all ages involved in that? Or are you really looking for expert? I mean, probably we were more reaching for the scientific community um, because you know, like it's it's about building a consensus model within okay. the community. Um, that said, you know, like the hope is that the animation could be used for outreach, but within the specific annotation tool, um, you know, yeah. like at least the commenting function is, is sort of thought of as some, something that might be more useful um, to get their feedback from researchers who are, you know, um, at the bench. Yeah. You know, so one of the things that we can do is, um, you know, Lauren, what I'm wondering is if in the COVID Info Commons newsletter that we do, maybe, you know, Janet, you could write up just like a paragraph or something on the collaboration that you're looking for um, and what you would like people to, to do um, at that site. And we could put it in the newsletter. We send that out every month to about, I don't know, maybe a thousand people or something like that. Yeah. Um, and as I was mentioning, feel free to tweet it and tag the hub and yeah, I've, I've been mainly using Twitter um, to get okay, it out there. So we've gotten a lot of views of for the animation and I know, um, but I, I kind of think there is parts of the life cycle, not that many people are working on it, to be honest. So that's, I think, partially why we haven't gotten quite as many comments on those sections. Well, feel free, though, to tag us as a channel, um, the Northeast Hub. I know John McMullen's on. He's from the Midwest Hub. And so if you tag us, uh, you know, we tag each other. And then um, you can also tag um, the COVID Info Commons, which is CIC underscore COVID, kick COVID. That's yeah, what I made a note something. of that. Yeah, okay, thank great. you. Yeah, and if you want to write a little something up, we can put it out in the kick newsletter. Feel free to tag us on LinkedIn as well. Get the word out there. LinkedIn, you'll get the more professional side of it. There are students as well, but you'll get the, I think, the people you're looking for more. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, because that, that could be interesting because I think it's very educational too. That's why I was asking. Like you do want people to make comments, but I think you're, you're educating people in a really positive way. So, thank you. Yeah, so um, we might even think about highlighting it um, with some of our other newsletters, maybe. We have like a Northeast Student Data Core um, where we have about, I don't know, about a thousand people too. They get a lot of students and educators talk about how to use data. Um, and so that might be kind of cool too. So yeah, leverage us as a channel. Um, that's one of the goals of the big data hubs is to be a channel for um, data science education, literacy, and data science innovation. Um, Okay, that's great, but I really loved it. It was a lot of fun to watch and I learned a lot. Okay, great. Um, well, I think it's almost the top of the hour. Um, any other comments or questions before we let everybody go? Okay. Kristen, how are we gonna get to keep seeing your work? You said, stay tuned. <laughs> Dying to know how we're gonna hear about it. Yeah, in some ways it feels like we're just at the beginning. Like we have all of this data um, that just needs to be analyzed. We're wrapping up at the end of October will be the last of the serology kits coming in. And for some people, like that's nine or 10 months of, of data that they're pushing back. Um, we'll probably wrap up the daily syndromic reporting um, at the end of October. Folks have been doing that every day for over a year and they're probably exhausted. <laughs> um, so there's lots of data for us to make sense of. Um, of a new survey that will be pushed out about vaccine mandates and, and perceptions of federal and state policies and employer policies, um, which I'm leading and really excited that intersection of legal and, and medical um, and you know top of mind right now as big employers push out COVID vaccine mandates. So lots of exciting work. It is lots of exciting work. And with any of you, I would say, you know, keep us posted as to the results that you have. I know some of you are NIH funded and we don't have the NIH um, PIs in the NSF database yet because it was funded by NSF and it was just like, oh, just put the NSF stuff in here. And then and we're like, oh, let's NIH. This is a pandemic for goodness sake. NIH should be involved in this. So anyway, so um, that's our goal with this new four year um, extension that we just got last week is to add NIH and new NSF awards. So we'll be able to get the PI profiles in there. And so as an example, Kristen and you know Janet and others of you, we would send you a survey to fill out to say, you know, here's a link to our research results. Here's my ORCID ID. Here's, you know, blinkety blank. Here are the collaboration opportunities I have. So we can get that information in there too and people can find each other more. So that will be um, an addition, which I'm really happy about. So that'll be occurring soon. Okay, great. Well, this has just been 
so eye-opening as always and intellectually validating and stimulating and exciting. So thank you so much for all the work you're doing. It's very important. Um, we're not near over with this uh, COVID-19 thing. You know, it still has the number 19. You know, kids are going to be born and, you know, they're going to go to school and say, why do they still call it COVID-19? It's 2022. All the little smarty pants kids are going to be asking that and we'll get to figure out how to tell them, um, you know, but it's going to be going on for a while, unfortunately. Um, we're going to learn a lot. Um, so thank you for sharing all your insights and for all the great work that you do. And Lauren, thank you for leading this as always. Yeah. And Benji and Brian, thank you for your support. Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. To see you in October. Okay. Nice Thanks, meeting everybody. everyone. Thank you. You too. Bye. Thank you. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.